The Royal Horticultural Society have said we are in crisis. The industry is lacking youngsters coming through. This is Eggleston Hall Gardens and over the next 12 months we're going to take you on a journey of what it's like to run a nursery garden. The top of the morning to you. Week 14. No, you can see by that wheelbarrow over there I will be pursuing my quest of irrigation I so much love that job ha. Ah, now look at that there's a little multi-headed daffodil it's one called minnow I think yeah if you're thinking like me that it's bloody boring you'd be right um we're looking along here, pasque flowers. Fritillaries, now here we are with the lovely crown imperials. Obviously I've got no bugger to buy these, but there they all are. Foliage smelling like cannabis. I often give it a good sniff when I come past. I really do like that smell. Crown imperials, they're not quite out yet. Very exotic. Remind me of seasides. Seaside pleasure gardens. Here are some more of the little daffodils. Little mini ones. Yes. Hmm. And here are some more fritillaries. Now look at these. Little fritillary, fritillaria meliagris, the snake's head fritillary. Aren't they just lovely? They have this typical, what gardening writers like to call checkerboard patterning. Beautiful things. And this is the dog's tooth violet, Erythronium. And this is a little one called White Beauty. Or we'll maybe go and have a look at it in the borders uh, later on when it's in flower. These are just young plants. It's called dog's tooth violet because the bulbs are shaped like a canine tooth. Another fritillary here. These are going to look lovely in a while. This is a uh, a Syriaca. It used to have a hyphenated name and for the life of me I can't remember what it was. Something like Ol other something? Oh, well, doesn't matter. Not quite out yet. They will be. And we'll have another look at them later on. Thomas is in today. Yes, he works until the end of the month, so we've got him for tomorrow as well. And then he goes into this furlough business. Oh, it's awful. He's up here. Trimming back the um, coloured stem sails. Oh, fuck me, what's that? like this one
I reckon we should do this on time lapse, like you said. Pipework was all changed, and we had some pipework the other side of the hedge, which I cut off and blocked off that end. Put some extra sprinklers in, and I've um, just connected it up from the back end. None of this has been tested. The shade hall that we set up earlier in the uh, in the year. Um, Obviously the water's all turned off, so you can't test it. Uh, you, you always get your asses, it gets a bit nippy when uh, you have to put things on for the first time. I'll probably be putting this one on a bit later on today. We took these hollies off of sprinklers um, because I was finding they were getting too wet and when they're too wet, they just sit still. The, 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 the roots, if we've got too much moisture, and it's not always the case, but generally, if there's too much moisture or too much um, feed close to the roots, it doesn't encourage them to send off roots looking for things, for sustenance and for moisture. So we've gone over to hand water in these. <laughs> this year of all years, when I'm not quite sure how we're going to get the watering done, but they already, they seem to be a little bit perkier. I don't know what it is about plants. Uh, you can tell when they've had too much water and they're just sitting still. Again, it's one of those instinctive things. And you just know there's a, there's a, there's a feeling to them. A lot of growers actually um, time into their watering systems um, a dry period. Um, and I think it's very, very important. We try and let it happen naturally, but occasionally it's no such bad thing to... Uh, look at these bloody birds. Now these paths were all clean. And what the little bastards are doing, they're nesting, so they're getting the moss out in between. I know I swear about it, but I, it, it is quite nice to see, really. Beautiful day. A bit on a cold side. But in getting your hands wet is a bit of a pain because you know, it pays up to the old arthritis. But we're getting there. Slowly, slowly, catchy monkey. Go on then. So what I'm doing here, I'm just pruning the buddleias. Give that one to him. It's about this time of year, well, arguably, it's getting a bit late, but they don't seem to mind. You just sort of do them any time around March. Any of the, you get your landscapers in to prune the buddleias, they'll do them in autumn or whenever, but these younger plants, they would take a lot more harm doing them in about autumn because they're just, they're quite a pithy plant, a buddleias. They're what plant? Pithy. 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 Pithy, like that. The stems so that, are very, so very, I've got that white pith in the middle there, so if you prune them, they just seem to rot a bit more if you do them in autumn. So we tend to leave them, I mean, we're at the end of March now, and these ones have started shooting away, but I'm sure they'll be fine. And these ones, they haven't been quite brutal. They obviously, they had a bit of a tidy up when they got processed in autumn, but obviously for this year, for this little pot to maintain this plant, I'm really hammering them back quite hard. So I'm taking them down to, more or less about there. I mean, most of the good growth is going to be this stuff that comes from the base. So you're going to get a load of nice, really fresh shoots and you just sort of leave sort of a framework. At the end of the day, buddly is the sort of plant. They'll grow bloody anywhere. They're growing in any sort of crack and crevice. That's why they cover the blooming railroad tracks because they're really not a hungry 
plant because these ones are ones they should have ideally been potted on but we can't have this many buddleys in a blooming big pot because they wouldn't the right minded buy a big buddly of that sort of size but this what's the common name of it butterfly bush because the butterflies go absolutely crackers for the flowers they do. when they flower that can be absolutely covered in them they are they were really lovely they are a lovely flower they've got a bit of a bad reputation but that's just because people don't look after them and prune them properly they let them get to about blooming eight foot tall but honestly when you get them to that size just take a bloody saw to it pretty much take it down to the bottom and let it come again they are actually as a flower they are a lovely plant do you think people get a bit snobby about them? Eh? They do, yeah. Even people who work here call them a blooming car park plant. <laughs> Which, you know, whilst that's not wrong, they are really quite lovely. Go on and rate them against a Cotoneaster. Or infinitely better. <laughs> a a Cotoneaster, I'd rather have a dog shit in the garden than a Cotoneaster. <laughs> I'd just have a mountain of a dog turd, like a little Mr. Whippy dog turd than a Cotoneaster. I don't know why you have it in for Cotoneasters so much. Yeah, look at that. That's a nice plant. That's um, a, a Chinomaly, you know, a flowering a Japanese quince. It's just coming into blossom. Have we got any more Lucii? You know, the apple blossom one. I don't know whether we have Luce Moosey. I don't think we do. Luce Moosey. Luce Moosey. <laughs> I did promise I would come back and have a look at the room that we propagated the other day. There. You see what I mean about the beautiful purple colour of the leaves? We'll look at this again in a couple more weeks and they will be huge. You know, two foot across or more. Very, very interesting this time of the year. The great big lumpy bit coming up through the middle. That'll house the stem. Grown from seed, it doesn't come out as purple. It's very variable. We planted one of last year's seedlings just here nearby because that clump's been there decades. Next to some nice Aero Metallicum pictum. Thank you, boy, smart ass. Just picking up on something from the last video that I quite enjoyed Malcolm butchering the pronunciation of the Kamasia. What was it you call it? Like Sakawi? Yeah, Saka Sakawayo or something. Sakawi. It's actually called Sakajawea. I think it's named after. I feel like she was a. She helped some American travellers. She was obviously a, like a Red Indian who helped some American travellers when they were trying to discover the New World or some English travellers rather. Discovering the new world. No. Right. So it's actually, yeah. Sacagawea, Malcolm. Sacagawea. Say that with me. Sacagawea. Sacagawea. Not Sakawi. Oh, not Sakawi. Fuck off. Sacagawea. Yeah, like, either way, variegated. there's not many of them variegated, <laughs> is there? No. There was one form of Kamasia that the Indians used to eat. Ooh. The native Indians of America. And I can't remember what, what it was now. I'll have to find that out and put it on as a subtitle or something. There's definitely one that's edible. You, you bugger. What? I'm filming this. I want to see that guilty face. Really? The bloody guilty face. Here. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I was getting through the end of there. There's fucking hundreds of them fucking drippers to put in. I, I did say yesterday, I did warn you, you haven't got to the fun bit yet. The fun bit. I've got all excited thinking I'd only got two more bloody rows to go. It's all right, Malcolm. I'll be out with your hair soon enough. Yo, you bugger, oh, okay. bu bugger off on furlough tonight and leave me to put all them fucking drippers in. I'm going to have to cut the grass at some oh. stage as well. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Wait, wait, let me just, let me just. Oh, there it is. Time to violin. Yeah. Wolfstein is violin. There we go. It was interesting today to um, hear that the uh, HTA, that's the Horticultural Trades Association, are asking for 
garden centres and nurseries to get some um, some financial assistance. I think they were asking for 250 million to help out the industry. Now, I'm all for helping out the industry. I mean, nurseries like this one, we thrive on growing plants. However, we have to differentiate between garden centres and nurseries on the other hand, on, on the garden centres on the one hand, nurseries on the other. The garden centres, they sell a lot of things other than plants. Plants are primarily not their main source of income. There's furniture, there's seeds, there's all the paraphernalia that goes with outdoor living. Some of them sell coats, uh, baskets, oh, any amount of stuff. Nurseries deal with plants. Nurseries are the ones that are going to be hit worse on this. Um, the HTA, well, we're not members, I, I can't afford to be a member. Um, I can't afford to be in their scheme for the, um, for the vouchers. Um, independent nurseries, most of us cannot afford to be in there. But we're based on plants. Not so much this one, but other nurseries that are primarily growing bedding we're going to be, they're going to be hit really, really hard. You have to think to yourself, garden centres, financial assistance, really, all their coats and their candles and their tools and things, that's still going to be there when this crisis is over. Nurserymen are a different breed and a different thing altogether. We have to differentiate between those. And, you know, if you have a board that's primarily run by people that own garden centres or are directors of garden centres or things like Hose Lock and one or two other things, then their interests lie with garden centres, not necessarily with, uh, with nurseries that cannot afford to be part of their membership anyway. If they, want to, they are a representative of garden centres more than nurseries and I, I would say to anyone, if their help is just for garden centres, then fine. But you have to be very careful. And you know, what's the difference between somebody selling coats and candles in a, a, a shop in town and somebody who's selling coats and candles in a garden centre? It has to be fair and even on other traders. We're probably stuffed either way. The other thing that I would add before I shut my hole up on this subject is you have to look at the garden centres and ask where they're getting their plants from. Many of them are importing their plants from Holland. The Dutch are getting a lot of their plants from China because it's cheaper, or has been cheaper, to get things from China or from other countries. They are sourced outside of the UK. Now if garden centres are bringing all their plants in from the continent, then why should the British taxpayer be supporting them? I can't understand that. Anyway, that's my rant over. This here are the trilliums that we grew from seed 2012. So as you can see, they've taken the eight years, but they're really starting to come through now. These trilliums are, are a little joy. Look at that one there. That's going to be opening very soon. A lovely mottled leaf. There. Now, eight years from seed, is it worth the wait? <laughs> Only, only the consumer, only the gardener can answer that. That's going to cost you a tenner, that bugger. You have to decide if it's worth it. In which case, you don't buy it. You go to a garden centre and get a GM from Holland. Sorry, I was being sarcastic there. It's not, it's not, um, it's not clever. It is with great pleasure 
Well, sort of great pleasure. We're going to visit somebody else. I've just been moaning about garden centres and all that sort of thing. So let's visit another one of me. Let's visit another nursery or another nurseryman. He's not so comely as I am, but uh, he's all right. This is raking over a seed bed to level it all out with my granddad's rake, family heirloom. It's been used since. When was it used since? Sorry? When, how old's the rake? So from the, since the 40s, so it's got really, really short, dumpy teeth, which makes it ideal for this job, just because it's been worn down all over those years. So that rake has probably raked everywhere on this nursery. Great information. <laughs> there you go, that's raked, see? Short and dumpy. I was not allowed to touch that when I was a child. <laughs> locked away. Right, once you've roughly levelled it, turn the rake that way, you're just trying to firm the soil down so that it's not all too fluffy for the seeds. You see later. And then you level it again to bring the stones to the top. See all the stones? We mark them out with telephone line from World from World War One. World War Two. World War Two. So field telephone, field telephone line. line. So it's broken <laughs> and tied back together. We could afford to buy some more, but it's, it's quite, I don't know, quite nice using old stuff. And then you get te technical flicking. And this and then you remove the stones, which is very hard if you've got a rake that isn't worn down. If you've got tines that are that long, it just digs holes. So you just flick all the stones off. Uh, since the forties, Grandad used it. Apparently, I'm not very good at math. <laughs> About eighty years. Eighty years. <laughs> Probably not the oldest thing here. I think that's me. <laughs> so these are seed that was picked September of last year. They've been mixed all over the winter with peat and perlite. And they've just started chitting. As you can see, when they look like little mung beans, that's the time to stick them in. Now, you haven't got to take the, the peat and the perlite out, but it does make it a lot easier to sow. Oh, well, for you, in about 20 seconds, for me, <laughs> about 10 minutes. I'll do for that. There you go, and that's what they look like when they're cleaned. As you can see, over 99% seed. It's a bit windy today, but Malcolm and I thought you might like to see how it's done commercially as opposed to just in trays. So, Despite the wind, we're going to have a go. Just got to be closer to the ground when it's windy. That's one of those jobs that there is no mechanical substitute. The only mechanical nurse we use is rotivating the ground. 
just the Howard gem. You've got a picture I've got a picture. Oh, see the wind's blowing the seeds. language you might want to edit that bit out. I bet you don't. That's the bit he wants to keep in that's there. <laughs> <Hey> Malcolm. <laughs> Daddy, What's up mate? You're not allowed in here? Could you walk all across the seed beds? That's a good boy. Oh they are coming up already. Yeah. yeah. They're the old other seed beds that when did we do them? Yeah, Two weeks ago? Good boy. Not you, <laughs> both. It looks like they're sown thickly. But what you've got to bear in mind is that little tiny bit on the end is the seed. The rest of that is just wing. If you took all the wings out of this picture, they are very, very sparse. So they're sown a lot thicker than this. <laughs> Mac. Mac one. one. Good boy. Go pick up all the rubbish. This is how we, the density we sew them at, so they're really quite close together. Um, but they don't, we don't want them to stay in the seed bed for very long because then they get potted up and we send them out as liners, so yeah, there we go. Now obviously the seeds need to be covered up. For the last 30 years we've been using coarse washed grit, which I will show you how you do it. Normally two people do this job, <laughs> but as I'm recording, Matthew has to do it on his own. You see? Yeah. Well, basically, as soon as the seeds disappear, you move along. You want to be looking for somewhere around about half an inch. I have no idea what it is in that funny new measurement that will never catch on. If you have them too thick, chances are they won't be able to push up through it. And if you have it too thin, the rain will either wash it away or you'll find it impossible to keep any moisture in them. And if they dry out, that's the end of them. Just get the rotavator out and rotivate the sand in. Now these were sown about a week and a half ago and really dispels a myth that you'll see all over the place. Japanese maples don't like full sunshine. Now okay, this is only 2nd of April today. But these plants will sit here, any that don't get potted will sit here until the autumn. As you can see, there is nothing. <laughs> no shade. These plants south is that way. These plants are sat in full sun in the middle of the summer. And if we lost them, obviously we wouldn't grow them here. So a lot of nonsense talked about Japanese maples, they're very tough. And there we go. <laughs> These are the aces, the seeds we sown, sown, sowed, <laughs> about three weeks ago. So Because it wouldn't stop raining. Yeah, we had to do them um, in the tunnel, which is an ideal. We wanted to do them outside, but yeah, we've done them indoors and they're all coming up like little, little trees. I don't know what variety this is. What does the label say? Oh. It's a. This one throws around about 50% purple normally. Now you can see, like Malcolm's, they got to their cot lead and stage. And the. You can see better on. Oh, wait, many of them really, yeah, all this one here. The second set of leaves. That's the first proper palmatum leaves coming out. And as Malcolm said, when they're set, they'll stop. And then you can pot them. You can do anything you want with them. Not until then. So a rough guess, a bed like this would normally yield probably somewhere between seven and nine thousand at this density. 
and quite often you find where there's a gap somewhere. Oh, I'm not going to bother to look, but more will come up. They don't all come up at exactly the same time. Now, before we used sand sieved over the top, the very old method, which is very time consuming, and in fairness, I haven't done for 30 years, so I have no idea how this is going to turn out. You basically gave the seabed a centre parting and pushed this ground is a little bit too dry for this but you'll get the idea. So you did that all the way down one side. And then you did it on the other side. I think you get the channel right there. You would then sow your seeds within that. You pat them down exactly the same so they're in firm contact. Then, which is, this is where it can go horribly wrong, which is another reason you want very short tines, is you pull that back over what you've just done without, without lifting all your seeds up to the surface. You'll never, you'll never know whether I would have done or not because there's no seeds on that. <laughs> but we'll pretend you did. But this is how we basically we did it. Before Father had a, a flash of inspiration. And we started sieving wash grit, which is a lot quicker. <laughs> I mean, there was a time when, right in front of us here, there's what, four beds? Let's have a guess for 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Years. You get 18 beds in this area here. You go back 30 years. We were probably doing somewhere around 65 and 70 beds. Not of all Japanese maples, but that's how much the industry has changed. Anyway, Malcolm, there you go. Bigger than your seed tray. <laughs> You're a cheeky fucker, Mr. Skinner. There's nothing wrong with my little trays. It's somebody should have told you. It's not the size, isn't everything. Cheeky twat. Well, Tucker and I are just going out on a little excursion. Look at that bank, isn't it lovely? Now we are going off to do an outside job. I don't do outside jobs, but there's an older lady, an elderly lady in Rommelkirk, a nearby village, and she always wants me to prune her blooming climbing rose on the front of her house. And I did it about, I think it was about 13, 14 years ago. And I said, I can only do it the once. Because uh, it's um, it's not something I do. So she said, "Oh, that's fine." And now I've been doing it every year since, and I'm really late this year because of the oh, look at that tree down there. Um, I'm really late this year because of the uh, virus and the problems we've had. But she does get on the phone and she, she rings up Lisa and says, you know how forgetful Malcolm is. It'll be the last year. Every year, every bloody year is the last year. dogs are um, just coming down after being hyped up. We've had a rabbit problem and um, the dogs are okay. They're great for getting in when the rabbits are in little places or between the plants or up the rows. But there are other times when I just simply have to shoot them. And um, for that, I use a little 410. I know that 
most people like 12 bores but uh, this is a little double barrel 410 and it does the job just fine especially in a, an enclosed area like this you really don't need um, a great big hefty weapon I don't even like using the thing really I, I really never have enjoyed um, shooting there are times when it's absolutely necessary we can lose thousands of pounds worth of plants but this is a little yield is little um, nice little thing it was given to me by um, <laughs> a posh bloke um, he saw the little single barrel 410 I used as a garden gun and told me it was a bloody pop gun so he sent me down to his gunsmith I'd done an orchard for him so I think he'd uh, he felt he wanted to do something for me anyway and this was a little present absolutely lovely thing I'm just on potting up a few brassicas these are some that um, John sowed before he uh, went off the good thing about brassicas is that they're, they're quite easy to do we used to sow them outside in drills years ago a drill is just like a, a little divot that you pull along in fact probably Matthew is going to show you some uh, a version of a drill later um, but yeah they're easy you just knock them out and the best way of doing them is to actually put them into pots but um, just put them right down right down to the seed leaves you know bury them really deep the whole of the stem because they, they put roots on from that stem and you get a much more robust uh, stronger plant if you do that and we grow them on in these pots until they're quite large you know until you can hardly keep enough water in them and then we plant them out give them a very good soaking for two or three days and, and, and they, they thrive I think this is a, a cauliflower. Yeah, no, it's a cabbage called Green Express. <laughs> well, one of the troubles with brassicas is, is the, the, the buggers all look the same. But you just get them out. This is the cauliflower. Uh, it's called Skywalker. We're just gonna get that out of there. Just. Give them a good shaking and then just separate them off. Yeah, you don't want to, don't be afraid of them. Just no point firing about with it. And I'm putting them into little seven centimeter pots. So there you go. Just fill it up, level it off. Mate, you stick your finger right in and get this right down, right the way down. And then just pinch it in. If you've watched my stuff before, you know I'm a great believer in pinching things in. There you are. Piece of cake. Now here's a funny little thing I just noticed. It's actually Thomas's. It's the Walimi Pine or Walimi Pine. Uh, Walimi... Uh, is it, what is it? Wallemia nobilis. It's got these funny little cone things on it. I hadn't really noticed them and I've been walking past it twice a day. I think it's a relatively new thing. Been out a few years now. In posh gardens and things have been planted. Uh, I think he bought it back from um, from Q with him. I think he might have bought a specimen down there or something. Yeah, why am I looking after his bloody pine? I wanted to show you um, some lovely spring foliage colour. Now this is a little Berberis. This is um, Berberis Thunbergii. Aurea. 
It's not a, a fancy name or anything. It's not one of the PBR ones. It's just a beautiful fresh spring green or gold. And it has these lovely apple blossom pink and white flowers. They're quite small and they're not fully out yet, but they, they, they will be. And the stems are slightly arching. It grows to about, about four feet. Um, it, it's a lovely thing. And another one that I'm quite keen on. Now this is one called Orange Sunrise. This has salmon-y sort of red leaves. And again, the same apple blossomy sort of flowers. But it is, it is really, really nice. Um, they, they, they quite go to work together. Well, I think they do. And the leaves, as they get older, they develop um, uh, a lovely golden edge to them. It's a nice thing. That one grows a little bit taller and more upright. You can actually see the, uh, the Berberus is uh, quite underestimated. People don't like them because they can be a bit prickly. Well, they are prickly. But look at that. They're, they're lovely. And there's another one there. It has a slightly darker... Um, foliage and this is one called rosy rocket the leaf is just starting to come out it will be fuller than that but you can get a sense of the the shape of it and then there's a a golden form of that and these are genuinely um, more fastidiate growing let's take that away and you can see you know the bloody way can you see them there's the golden ones. They're, a, they're a, a lovely thing early on. And some of them have, particularly the dark red ones, have the most incredible autumn foliage colour. So I rate them. Now, a little task I really wanted to do is sort these rosemaries out. Ah, you can see they're in one litre pots. Now, they've sat the, sat the winter. They're, there's no point potting them up at the, early, at the end of autumn or late summer because they're just going to sit in bigger pots. So we leave them in little one litre pots. Over winter, they've gathered a lot of liverwort on the top. So we just shoulder that as we are always doing. I know we go on and on about that, but it's really important. Just clean off the stem as well. Sometimes the liverwort attaches to the stem. So just give it a good fiddle. Now, in Holland, they would probably stick that into the next size up, the two, uh, a two litre pot. I'm not gonna do that because I want, I don't, if I don't get a chance to redo them again or to fiddle with them or feed them and fart about with them, I want them to be able to take care of themselves, so I'm going to use a three litre pot. And just, uh, normal way, just pot it up. It's not a, not a huge process, it's just easy, you've seen me do it a thousand times. Now there we are. That is much, much, it looks a little bit over potted to start with, but it'll soon grow into that, and it's got plenty of... Um, room to move and that'll last the year in there next year or perhaps the year after we'll probably put them into a five litre pot but rosemary is quite a fast growing thing um, and we need to keep those slightly on the drier side uh, it's not a thing that takes well to water it too much water one of the advantages of putting it in a smaller pot is that you tend not to get over watered but uh, you have to um, weigh that up against having plenty of room and plenty of root room. And our compost, as I've explained to you before, you can buy cheap compost. You can buy compost three bags for a tenner. You'll pay that for one of ours, but it won't run out of guts. It won't degrade. And when you're planting plants like rosemaries that you want to sit the whole year or or you want them to last a long time in that compost, then you want something with a good build-up of um, a good amount of slow-release fertiliser, a good nutritional balance, and something that's not going to 
degrade right down. It needs to have a good, a robust com a composition. And the stuff we have made up, while expensive, it, it, it repays us tenfold. There we are. Job done. Well, not quite. Now, our maples are just starting to wake up. We, uh, we don't do that many maples. I mean, we do a lot more than garden centers, and we have quite a range of them. But for us here, we're well behind somewhere like um, Bartholomew's and uh, what Matthew's doing. And of course, Matthew specializes in maples. Um, you wouldn't get more of a specialist. And of course, he does mail order. And uh, that's something because we're a venue, we're a visitor attraction. Um, we, we, it's just something we don't do. I, and, and, and I haven't got the patience to sit around um, uh, dealing with online things too much. Um, it's, it's, you, you just need people that are geared up to do it. And the packing is quite an art form. So let's have a nip down to Dorset and see how Matthew does it. There's Finch and Maggie, the guard dogs. Great pose. These are our one year grafts, seven centimetres that mum over there has grafted, on, has grafted on her own, um, which she used to do with dad, but he he's taken early retirement. <laughs> um, yeah, so these are the, they need a bit of a weed, but our weed is also taken, well, not, she's, she's, furloughed. she's been furloughed because of the coronavirus, so. That's not buried. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they're the little ones. All coming into leaf. Lots and lots of different varieties. There's Katsura there. In the Bishop there. Yeah, lots. And look at these Shindosoje. Some of them are further behind, like they haven't woken up yet. Look at that colour on the Shindosoje. Beautiful. These are our liters which ideally need to be potted up now um, into three litres but because of everything that's going on we are holding everything back on the potting up um, which oh that's pretty look at that colour there what's that one coral pink that's one of my favourites um, coral pink one of my, one of my favourites no it's coral pink oh yeah that's coral pink there oh that's sorry different. that's one of the shiki one of my favourites, I don't even know what it's called. <laughs> um, yeah, we're holding back on these, which hopefully will be okay for a year. Um, but they're so tall, some of them, which they really do need to be potted, but they're just going to have to sit here and wait. Um, but yeah, lots and lots of greens. You can see them more. Oh, look at the pink on that. That's What is that one? Shinde Soje. Look at the pink. Cerise. I didn't know what it was because we've got quite a few pink ones. There's another one there. That's something different. That's Shishio Improved. The pink stand out so much on this phone. That's another one. Vitifolium down there, lovely little leaf. Um, yeah. That's Peaches and Cream, very pretty. Likes the shade. Very, very pretty. Um, Orange Dream and oh this is what I spotted this morning look at the silver on the leaves that is burgundy lace but the way some of them wake up with such silvery leaves before they actually open properly and I've just noticed I didn't realize Ozakazuki did the same thing this has got really well you can't quite see it on here but the leaves are furry and silvery yeah. Um, yeah, and that's it really. That's, them all. that's all our litres, which will make three litres next year, and then we'll grow them on to be 7.5s in the future. The ones that are really nice shapes, we hold back and send, like, keep them for another year and grow them on. Sorry, that didn't make sense. The ones that are really nice shapes will pot up and then keep them for a few more years. 
so you have a, a really nice tree that's very pretty. Anyway, jolly good. Right, here we have our 7.5s. Oh, these are actually larger here, but um, our tunnel, multi-span tunnel, which has been up for about 25 years, blew off two of the tunnels, blew off in the winds we had um, a couple of months ago. So obviously with the coronavirus, we now can't afford to re-tunnel them. So that was our standing area for our 7.5s. So now we've just had to cram everything together, which is worrying at the moment because everything's coming into leaf. Um, it could, well, as long as they're not together for too long, it shouldn't be a problem. Like these are all the three litres just crammed together. Ideally, we need to spread them all out, especially the bigger stuff, because they'll just start growing in. When they put on a bit of new growth, they'll grow into each other. I mean, we've had plants around here that have been stuffed together for ages and they're fine, but it's just, these are like our prime plants. And we had such a good, well, these are them here, 7.5. We got such a good collection this year because um, we've started holding stuff back and potting it on for retail. We had such a good collection and now they're all crammed together, but I'm sure they'll be fine. We just need to space them out. But there's a lot of pretty colours in here. Well, these are two of Malcolm's favourite, apparently. This is Makawi Atsubusa and this is Shishi Kashira. Now, the Makawi Atsubusa looks very small, but Makawi Atsubusa, of all the plants we grow, is the slowest growing. Now, when you come to get sign material, you don't really want to be using any wood that's older than two years. So that's last year's growth, and the little bit that's grafted onto the stem is from the year before. So although it looks very small, if, for example, that was Shindus Hojo, it could well be up here because obviously of the extended growth and the two year, etc. So when they arrive, they do look very small, but that is actually two years growth. And obviously with this year, you will have technically three years of growth. Um, Makawi Yatsuusa is quite distinct. As you can see on this little plant, it's always described as the leaves being like tiles on a roof. They actually lay over each other. It's a very spectacular plant. Outstanding autumn colour. It's a very good plant. Shishikashira, of all the ones we grow, is my favourite. Simply because when you're surrounded by them all day long, something that is really different stands out. The very crinkly leaves. It grows quite an interesting way. It forms like little pom-poms. You then get extended growth and it forms more pom-poms. And as a mature plant, it is really spectacular. Autumn colour, bright orange and red. Right, we're going to pack these and send them to Malcolm. Yes, yes filming. Right. Now, we used to use polythene bags for this. Well, I've run out of polythene bags. This is just shrink wrap for pallets, which works very well. And this is to stop any moisture escaping into your package. Otherwise, the postman won't be for it if it's all wet and soggy. No one likes a wet and soggy parcel. <laughs> Moist. Yeah, no. There's a nice word. <laughs> we don't slip a couple of tubes over the top and like blue peter this one i prepared earlier in the cup you take that out I'd love to receive a package like this, a package of plants, do send me one. <laughs> Find out when it arrives in Malcolm. <laughs> I've always wanted to know what it's like unwrapping, unwrapping them. I have a very boring life. Yeah, you need to get out more. Oh, you can't. No. Stranded on the island. Thanks to bat flu, we can't go anywhere. So 
always a good idea to keep a clean bench as well. We like to, we like to keep things tidy here. <laughs> I try to keep things tidy. I might get you to wrap all my Christmas presents. <laughs> I, don't know, I hate wrapping. Very neat. Sorry, I'm not really doing much talking. I'm not feeling very inspired. <laughs> no offence to your packing. There you go, Malcolm. Catch. <gasps> God, I think you're throwing me. You know, I don't think if you were uh, wanting to build up a collection, you could go, you could do much worse than uh, start off with some of those. You can, uh, you can get them for, I, I don't know what math you're selling them at, but I think they're a young plant that's about a tenner, so you could build up quite a collection of uh, name varieties without having to go to the garden centers where you get the same old one although this one's very nice this is orange green but yeah i think it's one of the the better ways of doing it i wouldn't tell matthew i told you that important oh, fuck this yeah <laughs> How the fuck are you supposed to smoke with that on? <laughs> <laughs>